All right. Uh, you, though I think most of you have probably been in classes I teach, they're all pretty much, my approach is basically the same. That's because I'm a one-trick pony. Uh, I, I study and I present to you my understanding of, of for instance, here we're going to be studying Ephesians. I spend a lot of time working through it and wrestling with things, and there are a lot of gnarly things when you, when you get down to it, how clauses relate to one another, uh, nuances of words, nuances of phrases. All of these things involve exegetical judgments. So I work through that, and I give you my best understanding, and I present that to you. Now, when you look, you say, well, you know, you could take this this way. I understand that. <laughs> I know that, and I've, I've messed with it and played with it, and, and this is the way I understand it. So what I do is I present to you my understanding. I offer that to you for your consideration. So you hear it, weigh it. If you think it, it's on, if you think I'm tracking Paul's thought accurately, then you're hearing the Word of God. And so I, I pray that it will have that impact on you. If you hear me say something and I give you my understanding of something, you say, well, no, I think this is the better. Okay, well, then you just reject what I'm saying. But that's how I do it, and that's the only way I know how to do it. I invite you to share my understanding by presenting it to you and explaining why I think the way I do. Okay, so we'll, if, yeah, you know that because you've been in here, and this is, this is how I do it. I want to spend some time introducing Ephesians, and not that much in the way of introduction, but uh, I always say that's not downtime. It's important to get a grip of the context of any letter because we're, in a sense, we are listening in on somebody else's phone call. I mean, we're reading somebody else's mail, in a sense. Because in the first instance, a letter is written to uh, recipients. And so we are reading a letter that was written to a group of people. And so it's helpful to try to understand what is their setting, what is so we can hear correctly what is the message in the initial context? And then from that, we then hear what is God saying to us through what he initially said to this group of people? And so that's important. It's not, it's not a waste of time. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about introduction matter. Now, the authorship is, is pretty straightforward in my judgment. It's the, the letter is written by the Apostle Paul. You see that in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. And it was written when he was in prison. You see that in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 20. So Paul's writing, and he's writing when he's in prison, and this probably refers to Paul's first Roman imprisonment, okay? And that would put it around A.D. 61. You could move it a little earlier than that. Some may put it a little bit later, but that's right in the ballpark, A.D. 61. Paul's writing, he's in prison around A.D. 61. Now, I say the imprisonment's probably in Rome, you say, well, how do you know that? It just says, you know, I'm a prisoner. Well, the idea that it's probably in Rome comes from the fact that Ephesians is, it has a lot of similarities with Colossians. There are a lot of similarities, and both Ephesians and Colossians were delivered by Tychicus. So it looks like that they were written around the same time and delivered by the same person. And probable setting for Paul's imprisonment when he writes to the Colossians is Rome. Now, there are people that disagree with that. The two major candidates are Ephesus and Rome. And I'm with those who think it's Rome. And I'm not going to go through all the reasons for that, but there are a lot of uh, notable scholars that think it's Rome, F.F. F. Bruce, and a lot of other people. So I'm convinced that, that Colossians is written from Rome. Ephesians has a lot of similarities, and they're both delivered by Tychicus. He's in prison when he writes Ephesians. So I'm thinking it's written at the, around the same time, so it would be the same imprisonment. So therefore, I'm concluding that he's writing probably from Rome. And I say there's a debate about that, but I think Rome is where he is. His first Roman imprisonment. Now, as shocking as it may be, there are a number of, of scholars who deny Paul wrote the letter. You say, well, what do you tell me? You know, you're going to believe them or you're lying eyes. I mean, Paul says, I'm writing this letter. But they think, well, no, it was somebody who's posing as Paul. Okay, and they've got ideas they try to... Uh, you know, put out, and there, there are a number of people uh, who hold that view, uh, nobody I take seriously. But there have been a lot of scholarly defenses that, no, 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 that's all wet. You know, these guys who think they're deep, and they're saying, even though it says Paul, and uh, he, Paul didn't really write it, it was somebody else pretending to be Paul. Uh, there have been a lot of people, good scholarly defenses that say, no, that idea is all wet, and in fact, the traditional view is correct. 
that Paul did in fact write it. Peter O'Brien in his 1999 commentary on Ephesians has a long scholarly defense. Harold Honer in his 2002 commentary, another long scholarly defense that no, Paul is the one who wrote it. You can see several other people, Marcus Bart. Uh, there are a number of people. So uh, Paul wrote the letter. I'm convinced of that. I don't go for the pseudonymity idea that they think I can pretend to be Paul and that that would be accepted as canonical. I don't think that's right. I think if you come in and say, I'm Paul, by the way, I'm pretending to be Paul, trying to fake you out to be Paul, uh, that the early church would have said, if this isn't Paul, that's out. And there are reasons for thinking that. But, but it's written by Paul. I want to just give you the conclusion. Peter O'Brien's conclusion after his study of the issue, and he says, in our judgment, the traditional view has the most evidence in its favor. It is not unreasonable to think of Paul re-expressing, developing, and modifying his own thoughts for a different readership, facing a different set of circumstances. In other words, he writes Colossians, he has these ideas in his head, and then he writes something that's similar to a different readership. He says, the onus of proof is upon those who must establish that Paul was incapable of this versatility. We agree that the best explanation seems to be that the same man wrote Colossians and Ephesians a little later with many of the same thoughts running through his head and with a more general application of the ideas he had so recently expressed. Okay, so that's what I think is going on. Paul is in prison, probably in Rome, A.D. 61. He's written Colossians and he writes Ephesians with these ideas in his head, but he's writing to a different readership. Okay, now the destination of the letter, where's the letter going? You may say, well, that's obvious. It's going to the church in Ephesus. Ah, it's not so obvious. <laughs> okay, it's not so obvious. The geographical destination of the letter is very perplexing. Okay, it's perplexing because of a, there are a number of facts. And the first fact, uh, very important, is that the what are considered the best, the most reliable manuscripts that we have do not have the words in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, among those we have what's called P46. It's a papyrus manuscript. It's the oldest copy we have of Ephesians. It dates to around A.D. 200. That's an old copy. Some would put it even earlier than that, 180, 190. That's a mighty old copy of Ephesians. It doesn't have in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 1. Neither do the great Bible manuscripts of the 4th century. Okay, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, those great Bible manuscripts uh, discovered, one of them was discovered in the 19th century and the other actually became prominent then. Okay, so they pre they're, they're after uh, the King James Version. But neither of them does it say in Ephesus in chapter 1. Tertullian, who wrote around A.D. 200, the copy, or the letter of Ephesians with which he was familiar, apparently didn't have the words in Ephesus in it. And we have a number of other people like that. Origen, who writes in the first half of the third century, apparently what he was familiar with didn't have in Ephesus. Basil of Caesarea in the fourth century apparently didn't have in Ephesus. In it. So you have a real textual issue here. And in fact, in, in the, the translations that you have, English Standard, T and IV, NIV, they usually will footnote, and they say, um, uh, some early manuscripts don't include it. Well, yeah, uh, some don't. P46, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, these are big. <laughs> these are very important manuscripts. Okay, and, and then there's, so you have, the, there are a lot of manuscripts that don't have it in there, but then more than that, the letters, it just seems too impersonal to have been sent to the church in Ephesus since Paul had spent so much time there. And actually, there are parts of the letter that suggest that Paul didn't know the readers personally. I mean, it doesn't come out and say that, but you get that idea from chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 3, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 21. He seems that he doesn't know these folks personally. Okay, so you have this idea. Those are the things you say, all right, well, those are factors that say, well, it wasn't written to the church in Ephesus. But then on the other hand, you have, you have some facts that go against that. You have this expression in chapter 1, verse 1. It's a participial expression. And Paul uses it in the prescript of a number of other letters. And when he uses that expression, he usually follows it by a place. So he'll say, you know, the ones being in Rome, the ones being in Corinth, the ones being in Philippi. So you have that same expression. And yet, if you say, well, in Ephesus wasn't in there, well, you say, well, it's usually followed by a place name. Okay, so that, that, complicates, that complicates matters. 
there's a diverse group of manuscripts on the, on, the, on the in Ephesus side. You have a diverse group of manuscripts. They're much later, starting in the 5th century, but they're in different manuscript famil- families. And so you have a ton of manuscripts that have in Ephesus, and you don't have any manuscripts that say anywhere other than Ephesus. And finally, the, the, uh, the earliest copy we have, P46, it doesn't say in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 1, but it has a title, and the title is to the Ephesians, or really to Ephesians. Okay, right up in the title. But in 1.1, 1, 1, it doesn't say in Ephesus, but there was still a connection with us. So you sit there and say, well, how does one account for all, of, for, for all of these facts? What is an idea that accounts for these facts and uh, establish, you know, is, is the best understanding? Let me first give you, this is a conclusion of, uh, two New Testament scholars, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo, they have a book, uh, Introduction to the New Testament. They did the, the two of them joined with Leon Morris on the first edition of this book. And then in 2005, these two did a second edition of that book. But it says, in the end, we must probably conclude that we do not know for sure for whom the letter was originally intended. The evidence of the great mass of manuscripts, starting in the 5th century, you have a wide range of manuscripts that all have in Ephesus. Okay, they say, the evidence of the great mass of manuscripts and the improbabilities of the other views may drive us back to the view that it was meant for the church at Ephesus. If we feel that the absence of characteristic Pauline expressions of warmth that would be expected in a letter to a church where he'd spent as much time as he had at Ephesus, and of the references to concrete situations, if those things are significant, then we'll probably think of some form of circular letter, but we're left with difficulties whatever view we adopt. So it's kind of a puzzle. Okay, it's kind of a puzzle, where is this letter going? Now, I'm inclined to think, with a number of scholars, O'Brien, Peter O'Brien among them, that the words in Ephesus, that they probably were not in the original. Okay, I'll explain how I think this all works out. They probably weren't in the original, and then it's absence, that leaves one. If you say, okay, well, how do you then translate this if you don't have in Epheso in the original? That leaves you with a translation, something like, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who also are called believers in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's a little awkward, but it's not impossible. The only translation, uh, in, modern English translation, that takes a root something like this, in other words, that translates it without in Ephesus, is the Revised Standard Version. And they, a little bit different wording than I've given you there, but they, they recognize that the manuscript support isn't there. Most of them will translate it. I think some of that's because of tradition, because it came through in the King James most of them translate in Ephesus, but they'll usually footnote and say some of the manuscripts don't have that. Okay? What I think is it wasn't there originally, and my guess is, is that it was intended for a group of churches in Asia Minor. Okay? So Paul, in my judgment, he's in prison. He has written, you know you've got letters to Colossae, letter to Laodicea. You see that in Colossians 4.16, that he had written letters to, to those churches. So I think he's writing a letter to a group of churches from prison in Rome, and that circular letter first is taken to the church in Ephesus, and from there it was then copied and sent out to the other churches Paul intended to get it. So it becomes connected with Ephesus very early. The copies are sent out from Ephesus. You have this association with Ephesus very early, and that's indicated by this copy from A.D. 200, P46, that puts two Ephesians in the title. So there was a very early connection of this letter with the church. And then later, it works its way into chapter 1, verse 1, and it would be very easy for people to conclude, because Paul uses that part of participial expression, the one's being, and when he uses that elsewhere, it includes a geographical location. It would be easy for someone to say, well, someone had inadvertently dropped out in Ephesus here. And then to put it in, and then it would show up in the later manuscripts. Okay, there's not a great deal writing on that. But I just wanted to alert you to that, tell you there's an issue here. I think it probably is a circular letter that was early on associated with Ephesus, but I don't think in Ephesus is there in chapter 1, verse 1. But what, whatever their specific locales, now this is an important point, whatever, you know, whether you say, well, no, they are actually in the church in Ephesus, or it's, it's a more uh, a broader geographical region where he's writing to a number of congregations in Asia Minor, whether they're, whatever their specific locales, it's clear that the audience to which Paul is writing, they are predominantly Gentile Christians. 
Okay, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, you can see it in a number of places. Their ethnic background, is, it's shown by the way they're addressed in chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 1, it's shown by their depiction, the depiction of them as being religiously deprived relative to Israel. You see that in chapter 2, verses 11 and 13, and by the reference to their, uh, their past Gentile lifestyle in chapter 4, verse 17. So wherever they are, whether it's just Ephesus or whether it's a group of churches in Asia Minor, he's clearly writing to uh, Gentile Christians. That's his target. That's his audience. And that's, a, that's a, an important thing. Now, it's written, I think, Ephesians is one of the least, uh, it's one of the most general letters that Paul writes, probably the most general letter. A lot of the letters, all other letters, they're very occasional, specific. They're written to a, a congregation in a certain circumstance. This is more general. It is less uh, contextually specific. It's like Paul, he's writing to a larger group of people, so the ideas are more general. And so you say, well, okay, what is his purpose then in writing that? He's writing to this larger group of people, a more general letter. What's his purpose? Well, there's a disagreement, but I think there's some good ideas here. O'Brien writes, he says, having addressed a specific problem in Colossians, he wrote to that specific congregation where they were having issues with some false teaching. He says, having addressed a specific problem in Colossians, Paul has remodeled his letter for a more general Christian readership. He writes Ephesians to his mainly Gentile readers for whom he has apostolic responsibilities with the intention of informing strengthening and encouraging them by, by assuring them of their place within the gracious saving purpose of God and urging them to bring their lives into conformity with this divine plan of summing up all things in Christ. And we're going to talk about that, uh, probably not this week, but this idea of summing up all things in Christ, God's ultimate purpose, this mystery, and he's calling them to conform their lives to this mystery that has been revealed, Paul wants to ground shape and challenge his readers in their faith. In other words, the main purpose of his letter is identity formation. Who are we as a body of people? We as Gentile believers, who are we? What is our heritage? What is our hope? What are our promises? How do we fit into what God has been doing? And I think that's what he's doing, and I think that has great relevance for us today. All right, that's all you get in the way of introduction. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who also were called believers in Christ Jesus. If you believe in Ephesus is in there, then you would say uh, something different, right? You would say, to the saints who are in Christ Jesus, those who are in Ephesus. Okay, so here I, I'm, I'm reflecting this more like the Revised Standard Version. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, meaning he was called and sent by the Lord Jesus. We all know that. But we can get dull to it. We can just say, oh, you know, so what? Yeah, yeah, Paul's an apostle. I understand that. But think about what that means. We're not just reading some guy's thinking, right? We're not just sitting here reading, well, yeah, I, I, I like to read Plato, or I like to, no, we're, we're reading somebody who was called and sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a fully authorized messenger on Christ's behalf. Completely authorized. He is here and he's called by the will of God, not by personal ambition, not by human appointment. He's God's man. He is God's ambassador, God's chosen instrument for ministering to mankind, especially the Gentiles. So that says to me, listen up. We need to listen up. God is speaking through the Apostle Paul. He is sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to the saints, which as you know is more literally translated holy ones or sanctified ones, meaning those who are set apart for God, and that's Paul's regular description of Christians. Okay, It is not some super holy subset of the body of Christ, so that you have Christians, and then among those Christians you've got the people who are really super holy and we'll make them saints. That's not how it is. Saints are those set apart for God. It is a reference to all Christians. And of course, if you accept the way that I have done this here, it specifies that to the saints who also are called believers in Christ Jesus. You see, that's who they are. That's who we are. We are saints. Now, Paul desires for them continuing grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus 
And grace refers to this unmerited favor that God just lavishes on us in many different ways. And like when Jerry was saying, well, who woke you up this morning? How do you breathe? How do you live? God just pours out his blessings on us, his grace on us in just countless ways. And that's what Paul's referring to, in peace with God and with each other. It is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he opens his letter with pretty familiar kind of language. And then he goes into this great statement of praise for God. And I'm going to read this, talk about it, and then we won't get, we won't get beyond this for sure. Actually, we'll just get into this because I'm going to take a little detour here on something that it's important. Okay, it says in, in chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ, inasmuch as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him, in love having predestined us for adoption as sons for himself through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he highly favored us in the beloved. Now, Terry said some weeks ago, this is all one sentence. But it kind of strains uh, English readers to do that. So there are a couple of places where he, he, he says, in whom. Okay, he uses a relative pronoun. He say, in whom. And he still goes on with the sentence, in whom, in whom. Well, I've just changed that to in him and put a period there. Okay, to shorten, to bust it up into sentences. So when it says in him, it literally says in whom, and the sentence would continue. But it's easier for us to, just, to, to break it up. Okay, he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace with which he highly favored us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight having made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his good pleasure which he purposed in him for the administration of the fullness of the times, namely to bring all things together in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth brought together in him. Now this is a central theme. I won't talk about it right yet, I'm tempted to. But this idea of Christ as the universal reconciler, all things brought together. He is the linchpin of all that God is doing in His work in this creation. But He says here, uh, the things on earth brought together in Him. In Him, we were also allotted an inheritance, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out all things according to the purpose of His will, in order that we who have hoped beforehand in the Christ might be for the praise of His glory. In him you also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a down payment of our inheritance, vouching for the redemption of God's possession to the praise of his glory. You know, sometimes when you read the Bible and you cross these kinds of things, you know, what, what, you know this stuff is just so magnificent, so deep. You just have to sit here and go, you know, praise God. I mean, look at this, what Paul is revealing and saying to us. I'm going to try to unpack this, but it's going to take me a while to do it. Now, okay, back to the beginning. Chapter 1, verses 3. So I have verses 3 through 9 and first part of 10 there. Now, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who's also our Father. I mean, that's what he said in chapter 1, verse 2. He said to be blessed, which is a way of saying he's praiseworthy. In fact, some translations will just say that, praise be to. But it said he's blessed, which is a way of saying he's praiseworthy. And he's then described as the one who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. God has blessed those in Christ. And when he says he's blessed us, that means that he has bestowed on us various benefits. He has given something to us. He has bestowed on us a whole bunch of benefits. He has blessed us in that way, and those benefits are identified with this phrase, how has he blessed us? What benefits has he bestowed on us? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Then the nature of those are specified in verses 4 through 14. Verse 4, he says, in as much as. Okay, so we're going to see, well, what, how has he blessed us? What is the nature of these spiritual blessings that he's given us, these spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm? Paul is saying in the second part of verse 3 
that God is praiseworthy because he's given to Christians every spiritual blessing that exists in heaven. And as verses 4 through 14 make clear, Paul is referring specifically to the blessings that flow from the redemptive work of Christ. Christ's redeeming work, Christ's crucifixion, Christ's resurrection. We have been blessed and that we've been given the benefits of that work And so he has blessed us in that way. That is what he's referring to. And those blessings are labeled spiritual. And you could, and many people do, put a capital S on this. They're labeled spiritual because it's the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit who makes those blessings a reality in people's lives by impressing Christ's work on their hearts. It is the Spirit of God who takes these blessings and makes them a reality to us. Let me read to you a couple of quotes because I think this is, has some significance to it. Andrew Lincoln, who wrote a, a commentary in the 90s and word biblical commentary, he's a, a well-known scholar. He says, the blessing consists of God's saving activity in Christ. And this fullness of divine blessing can be described as spiritual, not because it belongs to a person's inner hidden life, but because it's bound up with the Holy Spirit. Gordon Fee, uh, you may have heard his name. Gordon Fee is a fellow who's a a New Testament scholar. He's the editor of the series of commentaries, the New International Commentary on the New Testament. He's written quite a few commentaries himself. But he says in his book, God's Empowering Presence, he says about this idea of spiritual blessing, he says, as elsewhere, pneumatikos is an adjective for the spirit that is pertaining to or belonging to the spirit. Thus, Pneumatikos blessings means spirit blessings, blessings that pertain to the spirit. This is Paul's way of expressing in a condensed form what he spells out further in this letter and everywhere else, that the spirit is the present means whereby God appropriates to the believing community the blessings that flow from the redemptive work of Christ. So the spirit is active in this. He is impressing this work on our hearts. So when he says that he's given to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ, it is involving the Spirit who brings these, applies these, presses these blessings. He is the one who gives them to us in that sense. He applies them to us. Okay, now here's what I want to spend probably the rest of the time, I know the rest of the time talking about. We have all of these blessings. I've said these things about this already and not yet. I've said it many times. But I want to get it, get you to see how fundamental it is, how important it is. There is, of course, there is an already and not yet aspect to the blessings that we've been given in Christ. Already and not yet. Okay, this is a paradox. There is tension here, but it's not a contradiction or an inconsistency. And it's very important to understand. There's a sense in which the blessings we have, they are a present possession, okay? Something we've already begun to experience. But there's also a fuller sense of blessings that awaits the consummation of the kingdom at Christ's return. So we have, we have blessings. They are ours. They're a present possession. But there is more to it than that. There is a sense in which it is not yet. And you say, well, this is just, is this a crazy person talking? No, I want you to see, for example, Paul says in verse 5, he says that God predestined those in Christ for adoption as sons. Well, there's a sense in which we've already been adopted as sons, right? We understand that. You see it in Romans 8, 14 and 15, Galatians 3, 26. But there's a fuller sense in which our adoption as sons, it awaits the resurrection of our bodies at Christ's return. You see that in Romans 8, 23. So we are his sons. And yet there's a sense in which we will be adopted as sons. Already and not yet. He says in chapter 1, verse 7, he makes clear that, that he says there, that, and also in Romans 3.24, Colossians 1.14, that Christians, we presently have redemption. But in chapter 1, verse 14, and in chapter 4, verse 30, he makes clear that redemption in its fullest sense is still future. You see that same idea in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. So redemption, we have redemption. Sonship, we have sonship, but there's also a sense, though it's already, there is a sense in which it is not yet. Let me read what O'Brien says. He he says, redemption, so he's talking about redemption in chapter 1, verse 14. And he says, redemption, which is a present spiritual blessing at chapter 1, verse 7, 
here signifies the final deliverance when God takes full and complete possession of those who are already his. All right, this is an important idea. All right, this idea of already and not yet, if you read around and if you've come across the term, it, it, the theological term for it is inaugurated eschatology. That sounds frightening. All right, eschatology is a study of end time stuff. Inaugurated, having already begun. Oh, so the end has begun. And it is a fundamental perspective. It's not some tangent. It is a fundamental perspective of the New Testament, and you need to see it. Let me read to you a quote from a guy named Thomas Schreiner. Uh, he's a New Testament scholar. Uh, this is from his uh, 2008 book. It's called New Testament Theology, Magnifying God in Christ. And Schreiner says... We've seen in this book that the already not yet pervades the New Testament and is crucial for understanding New Testament theology. God's promises have been fulfilled with the coming of Jesus Christ in his ministry, death, and resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the pouring out of the Spirit signal the arrival of the age to come. Even though the new creation, the new exodus, and the coming age have arrived, they have not been consummated. Death has not yet been extinguished as the last enemy. Satan still affects the people of God, and suffering still characterizes the existence of God's people. Not only so, but Christians still struggle against sin and are not yet free from it entirely. Indeed, the old creation persists so that it too groans as it awaits liberation from the tentacles of sin and death, Romans 8, 18 to 25. Hence, the final fulfillment of God's promises is essential so that the universe will reach its intended goal. The in-between times will end, and the glory of God as Father, Son, and Spirit will shine forever. Okay, so there, this, it's an important idea. You and I live in a tension between the ages, an overlap of the old age and the new age. We live in this tension. We have the promises of God. They have arrived, but they're not fully here. There is a sense in which we await their arrival in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here's a statement by Gordon Fee. I just uh, described to you a minute ago uh, who Fee is. He says here, the absolutely essential framework of the self-understanding of primitive Christianity is an eschatological one, an end-time one. Christians had come to believe that in the event of Christ, the new coming age had dawned and that especially through Christ's death and resurrection and the subsequent gift of the Spirit, God had set the future in motion to be consummated by yet another coming, the parousia, that's what that means, coming, of Christ. Theirs was therefore an essentially eschatological existence. They lived between the times of the beginning and the consummation of the end. Already God had secured their salvation. Already they were people of the future, living the life of the future in the present age and enjoying its benefits. But they still awaited the glorious consummation of this salvation. Thus they lived in an essential tension between the already and the not yet. I'm not through on this. Okay, I'm not through on this here. I want you to see another fellow, James Dunn. He's an internationally known scholar. He's a Pauline scholar. That's his little hangout. Okay, he deals a lot with Paul stuff. But in his book, The Theology of Paul the Apostle, he explains that in Jewish thought, you see, history was divided. You had, it was divided between the present age and the age to come. So here we are in this present age, see, and we have this present age where we have the failures and the sufferings of this present age. Look around. The present age is where all this hardship, difficulty, you know, suffering, crying. And the Jewish idea, they lived in this present age. And the idea was that, look, the, the present age you were going to have those, this present age was going to be terminated. It was going to be put to rights. God was going to be vindicated. You sit here and say, all these guys, how can this happen? How can all of this suffering happen? It's going to be put to rights. And they understood that, and they were looking for that time, see? They were looking for when it would be put to rights by the coming age. Okay, which in a lot of Jewish schemes would be affected by or would happen uh, coincidentally with the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so he sketches that historical understanding. I hope you can see this. Very simple. You have the older age. Then you have this end point which is associated with the coming of the Messiah, then you have the age to come where everything is set right and everything is great. 
This was the idea. This was how they looked at it. Okay, but the coming and resurrection of Christ, see, it had a profound impact on this scheme. It split the endpoint into two things. It divided this endpoint. Let me read to you what he, he says here. But you have this, the, the end was inaugurated by Christ coming, but completion of the divine purpose, it require, requires a second coming. So we have it inaugurated to be consummated at the second coming. Dunn says, Messiah, the end point of history, had become also Christ, the midpoint of history, and that shift is shown here. The top one is the Jewish idea, how they perceive things. Now Christ has altered that. He's taken the end point and he's divided it between his first and second coming. He has split the end point. And this has very significant ramifications for us. Because it creates this idea and as Dunn says, he says, the key point is that, is that in the gap opened up between the two comings. I've never used this laser pointer. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. You see this gap. See, we had the end point, and it's been split in two through the resurrection, Christ coming, and then we await the consummation at his coming again. And so there is this gap that has been opened up, this overlap of ages. I guess I broke it. Okay, Terry, I broke it. That's all right. <laughs> but here we have this, you know, it, it, it's happened, and we have this broken up like this. And you see that, here's this next one. Do you see what has happened is that the age to come, this age to come that has been pulled into the now. You see, and yet the, the present age continues, so there's this overlap. So the kingdom of God is a present reality. God is here. The kingdom has invaded. All of these blessings and benefits of being in Christ are present, but there is a sense in which they're not finalized. And so we live during this overlap of ages where we look around and say, what's happening? People die in death, sin, hatred, all of this stuff. What's going on? Come, Lord Jesus. Okay? So we live in this overlap, this time of tension between these two ages. Now, he has another diagram where he just, here you see the same idea, Adam, death, Christ in life, pulled into the present. You have another one, old creation, world, new creation, pulled into the present. So it's this very important idea. So you have to keep this in mind, not only in looking at Ephesians, but in studying the New Testament. This is fundamental perspective of New Testament theology is that Christ has affected this shift. Okay, he's affected this shift, and we live in this overlap of ages. So that there is a sense in which, yes, the, the kingdom is present. Yes, these things are ours already. Yes, we are sons. Yes, we are redeemed. But there's another sense. When we will be finally fully adopted as sons. When we will experience the final and full redemption. Okay, and it's very important because uh, questions come up and things like that. and It's important. All right. Here, I'll just say a little bit more. I heard that bell. All right. Now, the blessings. Okay, he specifies the blessings. Before the creation of the world, God chose those in Christ, those he foresaw, would believe in Christ of their own free will, he chose them to enjoy the benefits of salvation, one of which is that we would be blameless before him. We would be holy and blameless before him. It is those in Christ who are destined for blessings and one enters into and remains in Christ on the basis of faith. So he foresaw this. Those who are going to enter into Christ of their free will and he, these are the people he predestines, he blesses them. Now, a Calvinist, of course, would see this differently. Okay, they look at this differently. Calvinists, they believe that God in eternity, he chose certain individuals for salvation unconditionally. Okay, rather than choosing for the blessings of salvation, those he foresaw met the condition of faith. God in eternity, he determined which individuals would believe and thus be saved. So you start out with, God creates, and he has in mind, X, Y, and Z will be saved, and I will make them believe. I will bring them to faith. And the others, it is impossible for them to come to faith because God has chosen not to create faith in them. Well, this is, this is the idea. I'm just telling you. Okay, you don't like it. Well, see, in churches of Christ, we, oh, our, our, 
we tend to be Arminian, is the word, and that's what I am. And that's just, you know, that's why I'm here. I'm here because I, I, I agree, see, with, with how we see things and understand things. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. But I think we have a great deal on right. Nobody's perfect, okay? I'm not naive. Nobody's perfect. But I agree with you. But now there are, there are many, listen, there are many devout, highly intelligent, well-educated Calvinists, okay? They cut this thing differently. I disagree with how they slice it. But there are many people who are very devout. Some of the people I've read to you fall in that category. I've learned a lot from them. I just think they're missing this point here, and I think part of what drives them to their conclusion is the notion that it, their idea is that salvation becomes a human accomplishment unless one's faith is fully determined by God. In other words, if you have any role to play in choosing God, well, then you might as well say that you're saved by God and you. Okay, so their motivation is they think that takes from God's glory. Because God is the one out here saying, no, I've chosen you and I'm going to make you believe and come on. It's all of me. And they think if you put that there's a response from somebody, a free will response that is outside the direction and control of God, well then, you know, it's, it's God and you. Okay, but I think that misunderstands the nature of faith. Let me read to you what uh, Jerry Walls and, uh, and Joseph Dongle in their book, Why I'm Not a Calvinist. Explaining this view of Calvinists to have, have a faith, he says, if faith is viewed as our part of the process of salvation, then salvation must be viewed as a cooperative affair, and we should then describe ourselves as self-saviors in part. That would be the criticism that Calvinists would make of somebody like me. They'd say, well, you know, you know you, that's fine. You think God so much, so much, so much, but it's ultimately you deciding, so you're a really pretty cool guy. All these other schleps over here, they didn't have your insight, your brains, everything, uh, so... It's all about, see, because you ultimately made it. You see, that, that's part of what's motivating them. So it's not, a, it's not an ignoble motivation. They feel like they're, listen, we're trying to protect the holiness of God and that make salvation all of him. But I'll end with this here. This is what, uh, you got, I got to read this having set this up, so stick with me just a second. All right, I think this, this fear, it rests on an improper understanding of faith. This is a two-slide thing, and then I'll shut up after this. Here's what they say. I think they're, the Calvinists are missing what faith is. It says, the Bible itself does not describe faith as a work that accomplishes a task or as a deed that establishes merit or as a lever that forces God to act. Instead, we find that genuine faith is something quite different. As Paul's treatment of Abraham shows, the patriarch's faith had no power over God, earned no merit before God, and stood as the polar opposite of honorific deeds. Abraham believed God and righteousness was credited to him, not paid to him. God alone justified Abraham freely on the basis of Abraham's faith, since by its very nature, faith confesses the complete lack of human merit and human power. It subtracts nothing from the Savior's grace or glory. By its very nature, faith points away from all human status and looks to God alone for rescue and restoration. I think that's the biblical concept of faith. Okay, we're not buying anything and he owes us nothing. We're just sitting here going, mercy, mercy. Thank you, I'm through.